that are here because I promise I am as big a Chiefs fan as any of you and a lifelong one at that. So, uh, and you can, you can ask my boys sitting back there. We prayed for the Chiefs to win today when we ate lunch at CeCe's, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did. So what I want to talk about tonight is just something that God has put on my heart in the past three years, and it was kind of a, a subject, um, and this hodgepodge of verses I'm going to share with you tonight is a group of verses that have really helped me to dive deeper and see where I was drifting in my own life, and so if I could title this anything, it would be uh, The Tenderness of Christ and the Dangers of Hardening the Heart. So if uh, there's not going to be any scriptures displayed or anything like that that I know of, and Pastor Nelson joked that he was going to display the game score, and I was like, please, Pastor Nelson, don't do that to me. So... Uh, but if you guys would like to write these down, that's fine. You don't have to look them up. You can just feel free to listen. Um, and as the gospel goes, I want to start with the news that's hard to hear, the bad news. If you have the good news of the gospel, you can't have good news without there being bad news first. So when you talk about the gospel, it's like, well, what, why, do, why do I need Jesus? Why do I need the good news? Well, because here's the bad news. God requires perfection and you have failed to meet it. I have failed to meet it. So there's the bad news. What does a good God who is just and holy, what does he do with me? Well, instead of coming after me, he literally, as we read in Isaiah 53 this morning, if you were here, crushed his own son in my place. And then that son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, rose from the dead gloriously for our justification. So start with bad news to get to good news. So first, I want to talk about the danger of drifting uh, and how easily it can creep in. And this is why this first verse that I'm going to read to you, Matthew 7, 21 through 27, this is why that drifting is such a concern, or at least it should be a concern in our lives. Uh, because Jesus says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, I'm reading from the ESV, by the way, if anybody wants to know. Uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. See, the danger about saying, simply saying Jesus is Lord, but having a life that doesn't really deeply follow him, that's not bowed the knee saying, you're the king, I'm going to do what you tell me to do, is that we could be in this category. You have a category of folks who emphatically say Jesus is Lord, but they don't really follow after him, or, you know, maybe they're waiting on something. I'll get serious about Jesus tomorrow. Well, we may not have tomorrow. That's why the true blessing, uh, we sang this song, a, what was it, a couple weeks ago? Come now is the time to worship. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. And that's choose to bow down. Like, God, I don't want to lead my own life. I'm going to make a mess. I need you. So we don't want to be in that place of where we're, saying that Jesus is Lord, but our doing, the way that we live our lives, doesn't tell the same story that our mouth is telling us. In 2 Corinthians, which is why we find in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, um, these words from the Apostle Paul, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. It's interesting that Paul even here says, look at your life. Is, is your life 
marked like someone that has truly trusted in Jesus. Because if we trust in Christ, let me go off a little bit from my sheet here, but um, for, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. He's totally different. He's, he has different desires. He has different loves in his life. For example, it, it, talking about this, the sin that you once loved, you begin to hate. We shouldn't hold on to our sin. We can't bow the knee to Jesus and then go after our sin at the same time. We just can't do it. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 2, and it's really the end of this that relates to this idea. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 2. I don't know if I said that or not. Uh, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. That particular part of the verse used to give me major pause because I, I had no idea what the Apostle Paul meant by that. And I think that it was Matthew Henry's commentary um, of the Bible that I looked at, and he talked about the fact that belief does not get inside and change the way that they live. This is a belief that is a mental ascent, I'll call it. You understand that two plus two is four. Of course you believe it because you know it's true, but it doesn't, it's not this life-altering thing. We can believe, yes, Jesus is Lord, but not really bow the knee to him. And we can believe that he is the king, and yet not, nothing changes um, because it doesn't get inside and change the way that we live. Um, and we are going to get to this, by the way, but I am not talking about working to earn God's favor. I'm talking about what the life looks like when you have already trusted in Christ and therefore you already have his favor. So let's, let's make sure we get that out of the way right at the off. I told Pastor Darren tonight you would get somewhat of a proverbial movie trailer of where we're going to be in the coming weeks and months in Hebrews. I'm going to reveal a few of those verses. And these are particular verses that have been um, just very, you know, at one point they scared me um, until I realized what the whole point of them was to point me to Christ and the ready and tender Savior that he is, which I'm trying not to spoil the rest of my sermon, but we are going to get there soon. Um, we see in Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 19, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So we just talked about the fact that you can have a certain mental ascent, you can believe, but yet it says that these folks didn't enter because of unbelief. So there was kind of a practical, you may have heard the term practical atheism. So in other words, you have in your mind, yes, I believe in Jesus. I really do believe that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But what my life shows is a belief in I want to do what I want to do. Uh, I want to make my own decisions instead of bowing to me to what God has said I must do in following Christ. Um, and that's another one of the dangers of drifting is you can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You can think, I, you know what, I know this isn't a good idea, but... I just, I just don't want to give it up right now. I'm not sure I'm ready, and I'm just going to keep going in it. That's hardening by the deceitfulness of sin. And, you know, I have, you know, personally at least been close. I'd say I've probably been there 
when you get there and you discover that you are there, it is scary because you're wondering, what do I do now? I have wonderful news for you. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But in Hebrews 4, we continue kind of the same thing. This is coming out of the last chapter, the end of what I just read, verses 1 through 13, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed entered that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he, points, uh, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's from one of the Psalms, Darren. I cannot remember which one. You're really good at chapter numbers, by the way. I've noticed that about you, and I like that. Um, Verse 8, Hebrews 4, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I know, I just gave you a huge passage, passage there. But the point of all that, I feel like, finds its culmination in verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fail by the same sort of disobedience. Oh, Pastor Brian, are you saying we have to strive to be saved? No, I am not. Absolutely not. By the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. That's Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, so that no one may boast. But we are talking about going on to verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That, to me, provides the perfect balance between are you saved by striving? No. Do we have a striving faith? Yes, I think we do. In the sense that when we already are born again, when we are already in God's family, that's when the going on the narrow road happens. That's when it starts. Because there is a narrow gate. Jesus Christ is that narrow gate. John 10 calls him the door of the sheep. He is the one way, the one place we enter. But it also says that the road is narrow. So the road in following Christ, once we've been saved, that road is a narrow road. And so we should strive to enter that rest. That's where the striving comes in. Not being saved. The striving comes after we're saved and the stuff that we face on this earth. The world, the flesh, and the devil all trying to pull us back. No, come back on the broad road, please. Come over here. It's more fun. Come to the dark side. We have cookies. And so, you know, that, that is a narrow road because there's things that you say no to. And there's also things you say yes to. I'm going to say yes to seeking Christ. I'm going to say no to the vices that would pull me away from being close to Jesus. I'm going to say no to the things that would grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit. Continuing on, in, um, and again, going way down the road in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verses 11 through 17. And this is the last part of the warnings of, of drifting and hardening our hearts. Verse 11, Hebrews 12. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace. There's that word strive again. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. There's the narrow road right there. For the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. That passage used to scare me to death because I used to think, have I become like Esau? Have I lost my chance to repent? You know, in the struggle with sin, it can really get rough. And we can think, uh, have I gone too far? We're going to get to that. I have, like I said, I have very good news for you. Continuing in the same chapter, Hebrews 12, verses 25 through 29, we have the same uh, kind of string of warning going on here. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Let, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. If you look at the beginning of this passage, see, to, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. That's a really interesting Greek word, because if you look at Luke I believe it's Luke 14 that talks about the wedding supper um, of the Lamb. Um, I didn't have that written down. But Jesus tells a parable of a man that has a great banquet. This is, um, this is heaven at the end of the age that he's talking about. And he goes to the people and he says, come, I've prepared my banquet. Everything's ready. You have one guy that says, I have bought six yoke of oxen and I've got to go examine them. Have me excused. When he says, have me excused, he's, he's asking himself to be excused from salvation, from heaven, from the kingdom of God. That's the same exact Greek word used when you see, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. We cannot and we should not excuse ourselves from hearing what God is saying to us in our lives. And whenever we're reading the Bible, God is speaking because that's his word. So when you, and this is my final verse as far as hardening the heart, whenever you are in that place, don't refuse to listen. Keep walking after Christ because there's, we don't know what kind of time we're going to have and we need to put our rest and our trust in Jesus Christ. He's the only place we're going to rest. So that's all I have to say about the dangers of drifting and hardening the heart. If you're in a place where maybe you have been hardening your heart and you're wondering, can I come back? I am here to shout at you, yes, you can. And I implore you, please do. Now, in, this, is where, this is where the tenderness begins. This is where we talk about you know, how we have these warnings of hardening our hearts and, well, what, can I come back if I've been you know, backslidden or something like that? Yes, you can. And this starts with who God is and what he says and does. It doesn't start with us. So in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 3, we see, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. This is God the Father talking about his son, Jesus Christ, 700 years before he got here, by the way. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. 
He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice. He's not going to shout to try to get everyone's attention. He will make or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Jesus Christ is a tender Savior. If he sees you as a bruised reed, he's not going to break you. If he sees you as a smoldering wick who is struggling barely to burn, he's not going to snuff you out. I mean, who, who was Jesus hardest on? Those with the hardest hearts that were not broken, the broken ones he was tender towards, was he not? The unclean leper that sh had no business being around a rabbi that was confirmed leprous, he boldly went forward anyway and bowed down, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Did Jesus say, no, get out of here? No. First of all, he bent down and touched him, which you were not supposed to do. But Jesus could because he's the God man. He said, I am willing. I want to be clean. That's tenderness. And that's what we're talking about right now. If you've been wandering, you can come back. Luke 5, 27 through 32 after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, my second son's named Levi, <laughs> sitting at the tax booth, and, sa and he said to him, Jesus said to Levi, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you are backslidden, if you are drifting, or if you are wandering, guess what? Jesus came for you. If you're saying in your mind, maybe you've never put your trust in Christ, and you're saying, how in the world can I come? You heavily qualified. Jesus came for you. He didn't come to call righteous people that think that, oh, I'm righteous. I don't need, maybe they're not, but they think they are. I have no need of repentance. Jesus didn't come to call them. Jesus came to call the broken ones who are sinful and know they need a Savior. And he is a ready Savior. And in Matthew 11, 27 through 30, we hear these words. These words are most likely very familiar to most, if not all of us. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Here's the invitation. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Contrast that with what it says in Revelation 14. It talks about those who do not come to Christ by faith and, God forbid, end up in hell in the lake of fire. It says that day and night they are tormented without rest forever and ever. That verse gives me pause every time I think about it or read it. My wife and I have talked about that verse on several occasions, how incredibly heart-wrenching it is. There's no rest. There's no getting out. And yet here Jesus is. While there's still an opportunity for rest, Hebrews 4, Jesus is saying, I'll give it to you. I have it. You will find rest for your souls. That's what Jesus says, come. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you've been backslidden, if you've been wondering, come. Joel 2, 12 through 13. Uh, this is amazing for me because this points again to the tenderness, patience, long-suffering, and love of God for his people and those who do not yet know him. Joel 2, verses 12 through 13. Yet even now, this, those three words alone are enough to make me smile and shout with joy because God is saying this to an Israel and a Judah that has been rebelling for a couple few hundred years at this point. 
been very inconsistent in their following of God. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts, tear. That's what the word rend means, by the way. Rend your hearts and not your garments, because people would uh, often in that day, they would tear their clothes in a show of mourning, but sometimes it was just going through the motions. But what God is saying here through the prophet Joel, make it a real thing. Tear your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. That, those few words alone are enough to carry me all the way to heaven. Because I look at my own life and I think of all the ways in which I stumble, I falter when I'm trying to walk after Christ. My mind wanders. The flesh is a struggle that we all have. What does 1 Peter 2.11 say? Beloved, I urge you, strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust because they war against your soul. That's for all of us. And it's not just, you know, physical eye lust. It's, it's really the lust for anything that is other than going after Jesus Christ. First John 2 talks about that. Do not love the world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Those are always trying to compete against our love for Jesus. Psalm 86, 1 is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible because I can so readily pray it in any given second. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Uh, where, what else can you possibly say? Um, wherever you are, if you are in this place where I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, I, I, I've been backslidden or I've been wandering or I've been professing the name of Christ, but my life doesn't look anything like that's an actual reality in my life. Holy Spirit-inspired scripture gives us a guide to pray that we can pray to the Lord, I am poor and needy. And it's one, and it is a prayer that is going to please him. Um, especially when I think of Psalm 37, God is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. There's that tenderness just continuing to pop up again and again. And in Matthew 5, 3, connected to the idea of being poor and needy, Jesus says in the first part of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs in the kingdom of heaven. The word poor there in Greek means begging poor. In, uh, in New Testament Greek, there are two words for poor. One is you don't have a whole lot. The other is you got nothing. This is the you got nothing word. It means you're a beggar. And so literally, Jesus is saying, blessed are the spiritual beggars. That's tenderness. That means the lowest of the low. Jesus is saying, if you come to that place in your spirit, okay, God, I have nothing. Lord, help me. You are in a great place at that point. Psalm 25, 8 through 11. Um, just, just the, Psalm 25 is a great confession psalm. If you ever have that place where you really need to come before the Lord and just have some time of confession, Psalm 25 is a great one to read. Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. That's putting your faith in Jesus Christ, by the way. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. King David, the man after God's own heart, of course, we all know, or at least most of us know, um, the great sin he committed with Bathsheba and Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. God did not take his love off of David. David had some terrible consequences, but God did not remove his love from David. In Psalm 103, 11 through 14, I have a good friend named Ryan. Uh, whenever I would be talking about some sort of spiritual struggle I was going through, he always had this funny thing. He said, last time I checked, Psalm 103 is still in the Bible. And so we're going to read right here in verses 11 through 14 why he would utter those words to me. This is the tenderness and love of God. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. 
as far as the east is from the west, I'm thinking of the casting crowns down here, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. They're gone. As a father shows compassion to his children, I actually love the King James here, as a father pitieth his children, pities his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. God knows how weak we are. He knows. What a great grace. God wouldn't have to think about that. He would have no obligation to think about the fact that we're so weak. But he does. And in the preceding verses, you see it's because that steadfast love and that compassion. John 6, 37 one of my favorite promises in all the Bible, Jesus speaking. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Listen to this. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how you've been walking. No matter, it, the, the thought enters your mind, oh, I can't come back to Jesus. I've just gone too far. I was a professor of faith back then, but now I have stuck myself in this iron cage of despair. I can't come back. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Why not go to him? He says he won't cast you out if you come to him. So don't allow despair to capture you. In Psalm 107, by the way, you put yourself in an iron cage of despair. Psalm 107 says he cuts the bars of iron in two. Isaiah 55.1. And I will close with this scripture. Also verses 6 through 7. Come. You're getting this theme, I hope, hearing come. Come to me. Come here. Come now. By the way, when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, the Greek term there is literally like to me to say one of my sons back there, come here. Come here right now. That's literally the Greek term that Jesus used there. Come here. Come now. Don't wait. Don't delay. So you see a lot of this language, the invitation of Christ. Come, everyone who thirsts. This is Isaiah 55, 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 6 through 7, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You've, you've been walking wayward? Stop. It's sad, I, I, and I realize it seems like it should be more complicated than that. It's not. It may be extremely difficult and something we can't do without the strength of the Spirit of God, but it is very, very simple. We stop, go back, we return. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That is a whole lot of tenderness, grace, and mercy. Our response are you walking well by God's grace alone and focusing on Christ? Is he your greatest treasure? Then, God, then to God be alone be the glory for that grace and continue in it and encourage the weak along the way, the weak ones. If you're backsliding or drifting, come back. Our God is slow to anger and patient. Remember the prodigal son. The father saw him while he was a long way off. The father is compassionate. He saw him, ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. That is deep, beautiful compassion. If you're wayward and you haven't been walking after Christ, come back. The invitation is there. Have you never come to faith in Christ? Scripture says today is the day of salvation. Come and find a merciful Savior that you might have eternal life and joy in him. Freedom and forgiveness is here, offered freely as a gift by his grace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.